What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Critical Overload here. We're going to talk about several different horror topics in this video here today. We'll be talking about Saw, The Black Phone 2, Scream 7, Hard Eyes, and Terrifier 3. So starting off here with Saw, we're going to be going over this Phantom Limb novel that came out recently. And shout out to you Saw Space for sharing these pages on Twitter. We're going to be discussing the Saw show that almost was because Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan had some comments to share in this novel so let's just dive right on into what this show could have been it was during the time that the saw films were active this is what uh patrick melton had to say he was recounting the beginnings of what was going to be called jigsaw's twisted tales but sadly the series was unproduced it was going to be an anthology series it was a spin-off of the saw film franchise it says, often in between movies, you had a few months to think about things. This was around 2009. We always loved half-hour anthologies and morality tales. The writing duo took that love and spun it into a pitch for an expansion of the Saw universe into another medium just as the feature film flagship was winding down. In doing so, they found that certain bits of Saw iconography perfectly lent themselves to the anthology format, echoing one of the most famous shows in the, in the Pantheon. We were inspired by There's a Doll... He talks, there's a dirty aesthetic, so it was our version of Tales from the Crypt. It was supposed to be Jigsaw's Twisted Tales, and it was supposed to be hosted by Billy. He would have set up the morality tale and then come back for a little something at the end. It was funny because we had puns and stuff like that. The pitch was a success, getting thumbs up from two of the franchise's chief architects. Everyone sparked to it. Uh, citing Mark Berg and Warren Coles, who really liked it. At the time, they were trying to grow the brand and branch off to do other things but it was different then there wasn't a horror on tv this was before american horror story or channel zero before a lot of that stuff nevertheless jigsaw's twisted tales got the go-ahead to move the series into uncharted waters melton reveals ultimately we had deals set up to do it 26 half hour episodes ready to go as with crypt's unforgettable title sequence jigsaw's twisted tales would have had its own memorable opening to kick off each episode you can almost imagine the opening you're going through the warehouse you're going down you see a severed foot the tricycle you come into the room with the lights choom 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 then come to the tv or billy could just come out on the trike and he'd be like hello welcome to another story blah 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 with the 20 episode order in 26 episode order in place, the writing duo got to working on sketch out potential tales for the series. We even wrote out six ideas for them, but they had nothing to do with the Saw world. They would have been done in the same sort of gritty style. Stories about bad people doing bad things and getting their comeuppance. The doc, the document the writers pen nodded to such TV horror anthologies as Tales from the Dark Side, Freddy's Nightmares, The Outer Limits, and Night Gallery as inspirations for their approach. In addition, they noted that each episode should be 22 minutes centered on a flawed lead character who received their comeuppance by the end. Possess a morality tale angle, contain the action to limited locations, and crescendo with a twist ending. Summaries were then written for six potential episodes, running the gamut from low-key nor to full bore, full bore horror. They were our versions of Tale from the Crypt stories. This all sounds quite interesting, I'm not going to lie, but it's just unfortunate that this never came to be. It would have been a great show. It sounds like it would have been fun. It honestly makes me thankful for the fact that we're getting a show like The Creep Tapes. But you guys can let me know what you think about that. Now, The Black Phone 2 is rumored to be exploring the 1950s, like I've said in a video dedicated to it. Most likely going over the grabber's teenage years since a 19-year-old version of the character was being cast. However, Scott Derrickson did tell us this is still a high school coming of age story. So we're going to be jumping back and forth from past to present. Finney and Gwen would be the ones in high school most likely now, and it would appear a group of mean girls have a role in this story too. So in middle school, Finney had a group of guys giving him a hard time. In high school, I would guess that Gwen will have a group of girls giving her a hard time because I can't imagine why a group of girls would be giving Finney a hard time. There haven't been too many casting announcements since September, but it would appear a Final Destination Bloodline star is attached to this project. Anna Loray, who was in They Slash Them as well, might be showing up in this film. Casting calls are going around seeking out another girl to play a 19-year-old version of Anna's character. Now, the reason I say Anna Loray is because the photo attached to the casting call is of Anna. So, I don't think they'd put out Anna's photo if Anna wasn't going to be in this film somehow. As to who she could be playing, I would think that Anna is going to possibly be playing Gwen and Finney's mother. Just maybe she's playing their mother. So it's it's not out of the realm of possibility. She could be playing somebody else. But the fact that they're seeking out a 19 year old version of her character does make me curious 
Well, what is her role supposed to even be? Is she playing a deceased character? And we're seeing flashbacks of said deceased character. What's going on? So time will tell what Ana LeRae's role is going to be. And as I mentioned with the Mean Girl stuff, that's just rumored plot details. It has yet to be confirmed. So we'll wait and see if any of this comes to fruition. So jumping into Hard Eyes, a short but effective teaser trailer for Hard Eyes has arrived. Uh, I can't take my eyes off you plate throughout it. We get a glimpse of a chase scene backing up the video I did last night, as well as other things I mentioned in the video that the teaser confirmed, like the fact that the mask resembles the hard eyes emoji and the mask does glow in the dark. I'm not going to lie. The teaser looks makes the film look more than OK to me, because like I've said, I've heard it's OK. Big Screen Leaks put out a tweet this morning that he heard it's, it's excellent. It could just be a brilliant teaser for a trash movie, of course. Again, it's being pinned by Christopher Landon and Michael Kennedy and one other writer. So I think folks are going to have fun with this. Killjoy Jake actually put out a tweet. Shout out to you hitting the nail on the head, in my opinion. It looks like what this will be is Thanksgiving, but for Valentine's Day. I said it, it, it seems like it'll be the happy death day of the year, and I stand by that. But I think the Thanksgiving comparison is a bit more accurate. Hard Eyes looks like it'll be a fun time. And yes, I get everybody is not necessarily going to give it a chance because it's from Spyglass, but it is what it is. Now, let's talk about Scream 7. Matthew Lillard had an interview with Entertainment Tonight recently where he expressed that he'd love to come back for 7, but he doesn't think Scream needs him. Now, this wouldn't be the first time he said that either. It's just the comment you won't see highlighted the most because the Stu is Alive comment trends more and brings a bigger audience. He's not wrong in his sentiment, though. Scream doesn't need him, but it also doesn't need the other older stars or the newer stars that are coming in to keep coming back forever and ever and ever, ever. There's this attachment to these characters that is blinding some from being able to just say, you know what? Enough is enough. Certain characters shouldn't be around forever. If I, as a fan, cannot ever step back from fictional work and ask myself, when is enough enough? Then I'm not engaging with the art in a healthy capacity. That's just me. Truthfully, I think it's important to be able to recognize characters like Sam and Sydney are not written to stick around for endless on-screen narratives. And in the case of someone like Stu, who is maggot food, who had a TV dropped on his head, which is not what killed him. The electrocution is what killed him. I don't see a logical path of us getting Stu back. But it's nice to know that he remains aware that this franchise does not need him because he's not the only star the franchise does not need. The franchise itself has done a great job over the years, allowing Ghostface to become synonymous with the title that Ghostface has surpassed all of the characters that I love about the Scream franchise. As long as Ghostface is there, you have something to market. A lot of people don't want to engage with that reality, but that's the facts. Now, let's talk about Terrifier 3. Damien Leone did explain why a certain death happened on screen, basically confirming that it actually did occur. He gave these comments to Collider, but I want to shout out you, Kyle, for alerting me on this confirmation. He says, I toyed with the idea of showing it or at least showing him encounter Art the Clown and then ending it there where you don't know what transpired after that. But it was so important. There are a few reasons I decided not to show it at all. First, the most important was I needed that misdirect because you're supposed to believe it's somebody else before you find out it's Jonathan who was killed. So that was important. I liked that character so much and I felt like it would be disrespectful after everything that character has gone through and how much Sienna cares for that character to show that character horribly tortured. Of course, they wouldn't have killed that character slowly. It would have been really, really brutal and really sickening to sit through. Also, it would have had to take place immediately after the biggest kill in the movie, which was a five minute long shower massacre. So I think to then just throw the character on screen and have him killed directly after, I think the audience would have been completely numb to it and desensitized and it would have had no impact whatsoever. Now I get his reasoning, but it is unfortunate that, that kind of closes the door on any hopes that Jonathan wasn't the person we saw at the end of Terrifier 3, but it is what it is. At least he's not afraid to take risk. I'll give him that. At least he's not afraid to take risk. I don't take much issue with the idea of killing Jonathan. I just wish Jonathan felt more important to the story in Terrifier 3 before he died off screen on top of that. We actually have one last minute update here, folks. So we're going to be talking about Welcome to Dairy lastly in this video here today. So Entertainment Weekly put out an exclusive article with exclusive images from the upcoming show that we know is a prequel to Andy Muschietti's two recent hit It Films from Warner Brothers. And he went into some more plot specifics about what we can expect and confirming what many of us had already been speculating. So in the second interlude of Stephen King's behemoth horror classic It, adult Mike Hanlon visits his cancer-stricken 
stricken father in the hospital. Will Hanlon begins to weave a tale, one that he long kept from his son's ears. He begins his story decades earlier with his service in the Air Force at a nearby Army base. Will and his comrades open the Black Spot, a nightclub and watering hole that catered to black patrons. One horrific night, members of the main Legion of White Decency, a radicalized white supremacist group, swarmed the venue and burned it down, killing numerous people trapped inside. Mike discovers this to be an earlier sighting of IT, the shape-shifting kid-devouring entity that now torments his childhood friends of the Losers Club. While typically choosing the guise of creepy clown Pennywise, it appeared before Will in the form of a giant bird to snatch a victim in its talons amid the chaos around the burning black spot. This is just one story that Mike unearths as he attempts to track the entity's year-long reign of terror and dairy, or years-long reign of terror and dairy. Presented in King's novel through the character's research, collectively these interludes became the inspiration for it, Welcome to Dairy. Andy Muschietti went on to then gush over the story of it and his love for the novel poor giving us more details saying it's so rich with characters and events we thought we could do justice to the book and the fans by going back into this world specifically we are telling the stories of the interludes writings by mike hanlon based on his investigation that his that includes interviews he conducts with the older people in town in welcome to dairy we touch on the usual themes that were talked about in the movie friendship lost the power the power of unified belief but this story focuses also on the use of fear as a weapon which is one of the things that is also relevant to our times the main storyline plays out in 1962 which is the year the black spot burned down now of course that's different in the books they're shifting it around to be in line with what happened in their films while the book places the particular tragedy in the 30s that means we're 27 years before the events of the filmmakers first it movie 27 years is the dormant period of pennywise it's a different part of american history with a new set of fears for children as well as adults having in mind the cost of the cold world cold war our baseline is 1962 but we do a few jumps to the past every 27 years when it appears its cycle is marked by two catastrophic events one at the beginning and one in the end we are using the black spot as an event in which many storylines are built around we don't want to spoil too much but we'll say that the hanlon family is involved we will explore the origins of Pennywise, but like in the book, we'll do it with a healthy dose of crypticism. This all sounds quite fascinating. I cannot wait to see what comes of Welcome to Dairy. These images that came out look amazing. And I like that last bit saying that they are not going to do it in a overly, I guess, descriptive manner. They're going to do it with a bit of crypticism as well. So we're, they're going to tell us, but they're not going to tell us too much. Keep that mystique intact. But let me know what you guys think about this down in the comment section below. If you haven't already, of course, make sure you subscribe. Turn on post notifications so you never miss a video. In the description, I have links to all my social media accounts. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can message me there, of course. Let me know if there's any movies, news, or reviews you'd like me to cover in the future. And with all that in mind, guys, I will see you in the next video.